Chapter seven is all about thermochemistry. So we're gonna study a little bit about energetics and chemistry. Now, so the first thing we wanna talk about is what is energy? Energy is anything that has the capacity to do work. So energy is the capacity to do work. And what is work? Work is force acting over a distance. Um, we will be calculating some work, um, but we'll be using a slightly different formula there. And then heat is also something we'll be focusing on. And what is heat? Heat is a flow of energy caused um, by a difference in temperature. So you can observe the flow of energy, the heat exchange, by looking at temperature differences. So of course, energy here will be exchanged um, from one object to another. We have different kinds of um, energies that we're gonna be focusing on, the capacity to do work. We have kinetic energy, and um, under there we have thermal energy, which is, has to do with heat and temperature. Potential energy, it's going to be focusing on chemical potentials or energy within the atoms, electrons, and um, nuclei. All right. So we have all kinds of different energies. Right here, we are going to focus on chemical energy in this chapter. It has to do with like the structure of the atoms, the molecules, the arrangements, uh, bonding, and stuff like that. So let's go over conservation of energy. So law of conservation of energy says that energy cannot be created or destroyed. So that means you can only transfer the energy from one form to another, from one place to another, but you cannot create it, you can't make extra, or you cannot destroy it, you can't get rid of it, okay? So underneath here, this, uh, there's a concept we wanna talk about. So this is system, and the blue, whatever's inside the system is um, the blue dot right there. And then everything outside the system, everything that's not the system is called the surrounding. Where we define system and surrounding will make up the entire universe, okay? So we focus on system, so system, and surrounding are going to have um, basically exchange of energy. So units that we wanna be concerned about is joules. Okay, so what is a unit of joule? Um, joule can be broken down one joule as um, one Newton meter and, and one Newton meter, well, is really kilogram meter squared per second squared. Okay, um, we don't need to worry too much about it right now, but what's interesting, this is a cool fact, um, is calorie. Um, calorie is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram by one Celsius. And the calories that you see on the food labels is actually kilocalories, which is the energy needed to raise 1,000 grams of water by one Celsius. Okay. All right. The first law, we just mentioned that uh, conservation energy, you can't create or destroy energy. So the total energy of the universe is constant. So whatever the system gained, it came from the surrounding. Whatever the system lost, it goes to the surrounding. And that's why the total energy of the universe is going to be constant. So it says here, delta, this sign delta here is a symbol that means change. It means final minus initial. Okay, so delta energy of the universe equals to zero because the change in the system is going to be balanced out by the change in surrounding. So we'll look at this in the uh, form of pictures. All right, while we're talking about energy, we want to talk about what internal energy. So E, internal energy, is the sum of all kinetic and potential energies in the system, okay? So internal energy of the system um, is a state function. That means we care only about the final value minus the initial value, or for a reaction, products minus reactants energy. Um, we don't care how we got to the peak. We just want to know the difference in elevation, basically. So all we care about for a state function is a mathematical function where what the difference of final and initial values are. So in this case here, and we have um, energy diagrams, initially it's a low energy for the system and then final is a high energy for the system. Overall, the system has gained energy. 
So when you think about this, going up, it's kind of like, I guess, think about your bank account. When your bank account balance goes up, it shows a positive sign. Energy has been added. Money got put into your bank account. It shows a plus sign, okay? And your balance goes up. If your balance comes down, initial is high, final is low, you show a negative sign because money was removed from your bank account. So we were talking about the energy flow here in diagrams, and this is the picture here. So if there's a system where a system is negative sign, that means negative means losing, okay? System is losing energy. Where is the energy going to? It's going into the surroundings. So the energy is leaving the system, going to the surroundings. Surrounding has a positive sign, and then system has a negative sign. These are going to be exactly the same number. If this is minus one, this one's plus one. If this is minus 10, this one's going to be plus 10 because why do you have to add up to zero? Then we have an opposite picture here. If you had system gaining the energy, well, where did the energy come from? It came from the surrounding. So the system is going to be plus, maybe plus five. The surrounding will be minus five. So basically showing you the sign here. Now, if you wanted to go ahead and translate this into a reaction, we can say we have a, a reaction uh, where you have CO2 on one end and C and o on, O2 on the other end. So for example, if we want to talk about carbon and oxygen forming carbon dioxide, you see how it's initially is high and then going down for carbon dioxide as a product. This one here is coming down in energy. So the system is going to drop down in the balance where it's money or energy is leaving the system, okay? So basically the system is gonna be a negative sign and the surrounding will be a positive sign. And the system is the reaction in this case. And then if we wanted to talk about carbon dioxide and breaking it apart into carbon and oxygen, we go from low balance to high balance. It's gonna gain energy and it's going to be a positive sign for the reaction therefore the negative sign will be by the surrounding so basically the system here is the uh, reaction so while we're talking about that um we want to talk about energy exchange in terms of heat and work okay so delta e which is on uh, a change in uh, the internal energy there the change in energy um, is going internal energy for the system and surrounding. Uh, we can measure it through uh, heat, which is Q, and work, which is W. Okay, Q and W are not state functions. Their value depends on the process, but E here is a state function. So they just found another equation um, for E here, basically. Um, you can measure it by looking at the heat and the work. So. Um, if the system is getting hotter and gaining uh, thermal energy, it's going to be plus sign for heat. If it's losing en thermal energy, it will be a negative sign. If work is being done onto the system, it's a positive sign. If work is being done by the system towards the surrounding, it's going to be a negative sign. So overall, if it's a positive sign, workflow energy flows into the system. So this is internal change in internal energy for the system. Okay. So if it's positive, work flows into the system. If it's negative, work flows out of the system. So let's go ahead and um, look at a problem here. Uh, I guess I'll go ahead and write it out for you guys. So it has to do with a potato cannon. Let me zoom out a little bit. Potato cannon. So if you guys are not familiar with that, I guess you can search it online. You can see videos and pictures of potato cannons. So basically, you have a cannon and you shoot potato out really far by burning some fuel, okay? So we're gonna calculate the energy that is involved with that. It says here, burning of fuel performs 855 joules of work on the potato. So doing work on the potato and produces 
Reduces means releases. One, four, two, two joules of heat. And then the question is, what is the delta E of the burning of the fuel? So burning of the fuel is my system now, okay? So remember we were talking about delta E equals to heat plus work, and then they told you what the work is and what the heat is. Now you just have to determine a sign. The burning of fuel performs work on the outside, okay? So in this case here, my work is going to be negative 855 joules because it's doing work on the outside. Okay, and it produces 1422 joules of heat. So produces means it releases, it's letting it out. So it will be also negative 1422 right here. So when you add two negative terms here, your internal energy is really um, losing energy. System, uh, the energy is leaving the system and the total energy is gonna be negative 2277 joules, okay? So you have to be able to distinguish what signs are each one. So um, go over some problems to try to determine how you can do the signs of Q and W depending on um, if work is being done on the system, work is being done by the system, and if the system is receiving heat or producing heat, okay? So that's one part. Let's keep going. We want to talk about um, temperature changes now. So to, in order to talk about that, we want to talk about something called heat capacity. Okay, so when something just absorbs heat, the temperature goes up. That's how you can tell it received the heat. Okay, so um, how can we look at, you know, how can we measure this? So there's a constant here. The proportion proportionality constant is called the heat capacity. So the bigger the heat capacity, the smaller the temperature change will be. So like for example, if you're out in a pool, the water has a higher heat capacity than say your aluminum can that you're leaving out in the hot sun. So the water will actually heat up a lot slower than uh, an aluminum can would. Okay, because the temperature rise for the water is slower because the heat capacity of water is going to be a bigger amount. So you have to put more heat in, more energy before the temperature can go up by one degree for water. So it depends, heat capacity um, is um, C here and heat equals to C heat capacity times the change in temperature. So um, heat capacity depends on how much of the stuff you have and the type of material you have. Different materials will have different heat capacity like we just talked about for water. Uh, water is going to be um, a much higher value than uh, say like aluminum can. So I wanted to show you a chart here. You don't have to memorize this, but it's interesting because it shows you the different values there. So on this chart here, you can see, um, well, water, it says 4.18. Now, and this is not just heat capacity. This is specific heat capacity. So it actually tells you the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram by one degree. Well, depending on the unit, this is um, this specific heat capacity is joules per gram Celsius. That means it's how much joules is needed in energy to uh, raise the temperature by one Celsius for one gram of the material. So water is 4.18 and you see we talked about aluminum can is only 0.9. And you see gold and silver, I mean, not gold, and gold and, not gold and silver, and lead up here, um, they're a lot, lot smaller. So the metals have a tendency to change temperature a lot faster. Don't you agree if I heat up a piece of metal, it's going to like really get hot quickly uh, versus boiling water. Water takes a little longer to heat up. Okay, so that's something you've been already observing. So um, molar heat capacity is the amount of heat energy required to, uh, to raise the temperature of one mole by one, um, one degree Celsius. So I wanna go ahead and show you um, the formulas because you, you see how there's, there's specific heat capacity in grams and there's moles heat capacity in moles. So you can see the CS unit sometimes can be joules per gram Celsius. And sometimes you can see joules per mole Celsius or joules, or joules per moles Kelvin. I'll go ahead and write it out for you separately. Now, while we're at it here, um, 
there's a formula you guys want to go ahead and memorize. Q equals to MCS delta T. That means the amount is under M here. Uh, if we are talking CS in joules per gram Celsius, the amount will be in grams. This will be in Celsius. If the unit for CS is joules per moles Kelvin, this will be in moles and this will be in Kelvin. So I um, wanted to go ahead and show you um, some explanation on here. So we're going to go ahead and write this out, okay? So while we're talking about specifically capacities, there are different units. So let me write that out. So CS here is our specific heat capacity, or in some cases will be molar heat capacity. Let me just go ahead and write it out. Is Heat capacity. The most common unit is joules per gram Celsius. Okay, or you can have joules per grams Kelvin, or joules per moles Celsius, or running out of space, joules per moles Kelvin. Whatever it is, the unit. The formula is Q equals to MCS delta T, and times CS times delta T, okay? So if you wanted to do um, joules, um, you know, for our heat here, okay? And then it will be grams, and if the unit is joules, the CS unit is joules per gram Celsius. And then guess what your delta T unit will be? It will be in Celsius. Okay, and then another option is if you have joules per moles Kelvin, what would you have down here? You would have moles over here and you have Kelvin over here. So basically just look at the unit that's given to you and you can make sure you use the correct unit that you multiply it with. What are the other options we have? We wrote down um, joules per grams Kelvin. So this will be grams over here. This will be Kelvin over here, right? What about another option? Joules, I mean, no. the joules is right there. And then the middle part is joules per moles, uh, moles you can do Celsius. So there'll be Celsius here and moles here, okay? Now, while we're at it, since we're talking delta T, let's talk a little bit about delta T here. So if I tell you delta T is 25 degrees Celsius, what is my delta T in Kelvin? Now, a lot of people are going to get this wrong. So your first guess might be like, oh, well, 25 Celsius. Well, that would be 25 plus 273, and you wanna say 298. And that is the wrong answer. Why? Because we're not talking temperature, we're talking change in temperature now. So if the change in temperature was 25 degrees, for example, how in the world would you get a 25 degree change in temperature? I'll give you an example. It doesn't matter. We'll just pick, pick a number, okay? So we'll do something easy, 0 and 25. 0 Celsius and 25 Celsius, okay? So that's how you get the difference of 25 Celsius right there. Agree? So what if I said, okay, this here is 25 Celsius. Remember, what is zero Celsius in Kelvin? It's 273 Kelvin. What is 25 Celsius in Kelvin? 298 Kelvin, right? And then what's the difference between 290 and 273? Oh, guess what? It's 25 Kelvin also. So this is where people sometimes make huge mistakes is instead of doing, you know, Celsius and Kelvin being the same number because it's delta. I remember the scale between Kelvin and Celsius are exactly the same size. It's just offset by 273 every time. So if you had put down 298 over there in your calculations, you would have been in big trouble because that would have been the wrong number. Okay, so very important right here about delta T. Celsius and Kelvin, doesn't matter, the number stays the same. So we wanna go ahead and calculate um, just a simple example using um, 
some of this uh, Q to MCS delta T formula. Okay, so let's go ahead and try that. So the question is a copper penny. Is this before 1982 was found in the snow? How much heat is absorbed by the penny? as it warms up from negative 8.0 Celsius to 37.0 Celsius. Assume the penny is pure copper and has a mass of 3.10 grams. So CS for copper, the unit is 0.385 joules per gram Celsius. All right, so with this here, our joules per gram Celsius, so now you know Q equals to MCS delta T, and I'm gonna go ahead and write the CS in the middle, 0.385 joules per gram Celsius. So that means what do I need over here? I need grams, I need Celsius over here. So what's my gram? 3.10 grams. What's my delta T? What is the difference between 37 and negative eight, right? So that delta T here, I'll go ahead and calculate it up here, is basically final temperature minus initial temperature. So 37.0 Celsius minus negative 8.0 Celsius. Final minus initial. Okay, I always remember it's final minus initial. So in this case here, um, we put down over here, uh, all right, so put this in your calculator, you will get 53.7 joules. Okay, so that's how we would apply this formula here in the unit. Now remember, whatever this unit is, change it accordingly with these values here. And remember the delta T, Kelvin and Celsius, the number will stay the same. So let's talk about uh, transferring energies um, between two objects, okay? So um, let's say if I put a piece of hot metal in, in some cold room temperature water, and my metal was like 100 degrees, and then my water was like 25 degrees because it's the room temperature, depending on my metal or how big my metal is, how much water I have, in the end, after I plop the metal in, the metal is going to cool down and the water is going to warm up. And at the end, at thermal equilibrium, um, the water's temperature and the metal's temperature will be exactly the same, okay? So in this case here, um, we know the final temperature of both of these guys will be the same, but the initial will be different, obviously, because the metal was really hot and water was cool, but they come down to the same temperature at the end, okay? And so in this case here, it says here, the block of metal, 55 degrees, so much is water initially at 25, and then the metal is gonna lose energy to the water, so the metal is going to um, uh, be opposite sign of the water, okay? Um, and then metal's uh, gonna lose the energy to the water, water's gonna gain it. Um, whatever the exact temperature change is going to be, that depends on how much metal you have, what type of metal you have, and how much water you have, okay? So let's go ahead and do a calculation with this. Um, I'll actually do two different kinds just to show you like a variety of questions that you could potentially see. So one of them that we're going to go ahead and start on says a block of copper
of a known mass has an initial temperature of 65.4 Celsius. And it says the copper is immersed in a beaker containing 95.7 grams of water at 22.7 Celsius. When the two substances reach thermal equilibrium, the final temperature, thermal equilibrium means the final temperature is both the same, okay? The final temperature is 24.2 Celsius. What is the mass of the copper block? <clears throat> so I'll give you the CS values for copper and water here. 0 0.385 joules per gram Celsius and then water is 4.18 joules per gram Celsius. Okay, so in this case, we know the metal is gonna lose the energy, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and say the metal is gonna have a negative sign. And then the same amount of heat will be for water, but water is exact opposite number, so I'll give you a positive sign. Okay, that's the idea here. Now, I know metal's formula is going to be <clears throat> a mass M of the metal, CS of the metal, and then delta T of the metal. Okay, I'm looking for this term. I have CS, I have delta T of the metal. I can calculate that because they gave us the temperatures, initial and final. So I'm missing that piece. So I can't do that one yet, but I have every piece I need for water, okay? Water's number is gonna be M of water, um, CS of water, delta T of water. I have all of it. So let's go ahead and put that in. So how much water do I have? I have 95. 0.7 grams of water that was given to us in the question. What was the CS of water? 4.18 joules per gram Celsius. So my temperature, the delta T here has to be in Celsius. So it, and what was the initial? Initial is 22.7, final is 24.2. So delta T would be 24.2 Celsius minus 22.7 Celsius, okay? And then you put this together, you can get the Q of water, which will be 600.039 joules. Um, right there, I'm gonna underline just a second number because this one here um, ends up with just um, 2663. All right, so let's keep going here. Now that I know water is positive 600.039 metals number um in this case specifically not just metal is copper right q of copper is going to be negative 600.039 and i always underline the second number because i know in the end i'm just going to be able to tell my mass in two sig figs so um we're looking for m of the metal we don't know what it is I'll go ahead and leave that as M of copper. And then CS of the metal was 0 0.385 joules per gram Celsius. And then we gotta do the temperature difference of the metal. What was the temperature difference? Initial is 65.4, final is 24.2. Remember this final is for both the metal and water. So I'm gonna go ahead, final is 24.2, 
minus initial 65.4 cells. Okay, so you put this in your calculator um, and then you solve for the mass right here, which then you just have to take negative 600.039 divided by this value and that value, you should get the uh, mass of copper right there. So mass of copper is going to end up being 38 grams of copper. Okay, so that's how you really do this problem. So this one's pretty simple. I wanna show you another one, a similar question, but this time, instead of asking you the mass, now sometimes they can ask you for the mass of the copper block. Sometimes they'll ask you for the, maybe the specific heat capacity of the metal, but sometimes they ask you for the um, final temperature or maybe the initial, they'll give you one of those. Like it's just one of these pieces that are missing. Okay, so the next question is gonna be a little different with math, but the question is gonna read about the same or the question is they're gonna ask you what's the final temperature, okay, for both of them. So I'm gonna go ahead and write that question out. <laughs> All right, a 32.5 grams cube of aluminum initially at 45.8 Celsius is submerged into 105.3 grams of water at 15.4 Celsius. What is the final temperature for both substances? At thermal equilibrium. Again, C as water is 4.18 joules per gram Celsius. C as for aluminum is 0 0.903 joules per gram Celsius. So in this case here, again, hot piece of aluminum into water. Aluminum is gonna have the negative sign. Water is gonna have the positive sign. It's gonna be the same number. Okay, and what's the formula for aluminum? It was MC is delta T, MC is delta T, but this is for aluminum, that's for water. So I'm gonna go ahead and write that formula out, okay? So um, negative sign and an M of metal, 32.5 grams, and then CS of my metal, 0 0.903 joules per gram Celsius, and then I need the temperature. So the temperature is, I don't know the final temperature, so I'm gonna just go ahead and put TF minus my initial for the metal is 45.8 Celsius, okay? And then I can do the same thing for water. Water doesn't need a negative sign, it's gonna be uh, a positive number. They're both gonna end up being the same number, but this is negative, this one's positive, okay? So mass of water will be uh, 105.3, and then 4.18 joules per gram Celsius for the specific heat capacity. And then again, final temperature, we don't know what it is, but my initial temperature for water was 15.4 Celsius. Now your job is mathematically solve for TF. Okay, so I'm going to work the math out. So what I'm going to do is multiply this ter two terms here and then take that term, multiply with TF and 45.8 on one side here, and then do the same, 105.3 times 4.18, and then times TF and 15.4, I'll have uh, four terms out, okay? So um, I'll go ahead and write it out, and I'll work the math out step-by-step, so, uh, step, but you can take a pause here, or you just wanna go ahead and punch it in your calculator, you can also go ahead and do that. So just working it out for you. Now, if you have trouble with this, um, make sure you ask questions, okay?
So what I've done is that was the multiplication of these two terms on the top. Copy that down and then take this times that to get this, this times that to get the second term. Same process over here, first term times TF, first term times second term to get that value. I just go. I just went ahead and, and, and dropped the units there so we wouldn't have to deal with the units as well. But just know that when you solve for it, your temperature will be in Celsius right now, okay? So then I'm gonna arrange the TF values on one side, okay? The two TF values put it on one side. So I'm gonna go ahead and write that out. And then the numbers on the other side. And then add the two TF values together. Add the two numbers together. And then TF is basically this value divided by a um, 469.5015. So it's 8122.4871 divided by 469.5015. My TF ends up being 17.3 Celsius. The reason why I just kept one decimal place here is because our answers, or our temperatures were beginning all just in one decimal place. So you can just go ahead and report the same type of um, numbers, okay? So there's one more question that's very similar to this. Q is MCS delta T, but they're going to ask you to solve for molar mass. And I'm going to show you how to do that in case you saw this question. Okay, so here it is. It says a 10 gram sample of a metal at 78.0 Celsius is submerged in 50 mils, 50.0 milliliters of water at 25.0 Celsius. The final temperature of the water and the metal, okay, because they're the same, right? They don't tell you that, but I added the end metal part, uh, is measured to be 26.1 degrees Celsius. Assuming, when this is um, going to be the assumption here, if they don't mention there's heat loss, assume there's no heat loss, okay? So uh, I'm just gonna write it down. Assuming no heat is lost to the surrounding, what is the approximate molar mass of the metal. So to get the molar mass of the metal based on the specific heat capacity, there is a law here, it's called Duhon Petit Law. I'll write it out. So Duhon Petit Law says, um, Specific heat capacity, okay, is always going to be related um, to our um, molar mass. So technically, the formula I'm going to go ahead and give you guys as is 25 over molar mass. Let me explain where the 25 comes from, okay? The 25 actually comes from 3R, which is a gas constant, but in joules unit over molar mass. Okay, so um, I'll write it out as three and then times 8.314 joules per moles. Kelvin, and then your um, molar mass is in grams per mole. Okay, because of that, we can say molar mass 
equals to 25 over specific heat capacity. I guess I should write CS from there. Okay, that would be um, what you want here. And you're going to want to go ahead and use, um, get your specific heat capacity and put this value in here. So because we have um, 8.314 here and it's 25, so you're literally just going to take 25 and divide it by your CS value after you calculate the CS, okay? So let's go ahead and do that. So it's all gonna be the same thing. So we'll go ahead and work it out. Um, we solve for the C. So I'm gonna go ahead and write it out. So the metal is 10 grams, so Q metal equals to Q of water, remember? Okay. This time I'm just gonna go ahead and do a little bit of a shortcut and start putting the formulas in, okay? So um, that means um, negative M uh, metal, CS metal, delta T metal equals to mass of water, CS water, delta T of water. Okay, so the CS metal is going to be M water times CS water delta T water divided by M of metal and then delta T of metal. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and plug that value in here. Um, so we can go ahead and write down the delta T of water and the rest of them is all there already. So um, delta T of water. So final is 26.1 minus initial 25. Okay, and then delta T of metal was 26.1 as final minus 78.0 Celsius as initial. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug those values in here. So M of water was 50. So again, I do you know why I said it's 50 grams here? Because density of water is one grams per mil, okay? So you need to remember this. Density of water is 1.00 grams per mil. I guess I'll go ahead and write it on. So 50 mils of water is 50 grams of water. It's 1.1 over there. And then the mass of the metal was um, 10 grams. Oh yeah, we gotta do a negative sign, right, remember? Negative 10, negative 51.9 Celsius. So the CS is going to end up being 0 0.44 joules per gram Celsius. Okay, so according to this law here, I'm going to go ahead and write down. Uh, the units here. So joules per gram Celsius is the same thing as joules per gram Kelvin, agree? Because the Celsius and the Kelvin is the same exact number now, right? So that equals to 0 0.44 joules per gram Kelvin. Now when you do that, we put it up here, this 25 here had a unit of joules per moles Kelvin, and then you put your CS is 0.44 joules per gram kelvin the joules and kelvin sign cancels off and then all you end up being is uh you have the inverse of over here so you end up getting grams per mole okay so uh, your unit is going to be grams per moles 
mathematically, and your molar mass ends up being 56 over here. So that's how we would do this problem. So just want to make sure you remember, it's really three times R, the gas constant, but I don't want you guys to be con confused with which one it was. So just go ahead and use 25, you'll be safe. Okay, so it's 25 over CS. And um, the reason I didn't have to worry about changing the number for CS because Celsius and Kelvin is exactly the same number. Why? Because I just showed you on the previous um, page over here. Same exact thing, okay? So that's not gonna change the value at all. And that's why that just goes there. So that's how you would need to calculate if they ask you for molar mass. Now, so we've talked a lot about heat and delta E equals to Q plus W. So let's go ahead and talk about work a little bit, the term W, okay? So let's talk about um, pressure volume work. So work, the formula we wanna go ahead and use is uh, negative P, which is the pressure, external pressure of the surround um, area. And then delta V is change in volume, okay? So what we wanna do calculations, it will be work equals to minus P delta V. And because we have P and V here, our units will be in ATM liter. And so you don't need to memorize this. If you need to convert, I'll try, I'll make sure to put this on um, your test. Now, if you're doing homework, you should be able to look this up. So have this handy for you to look up. It's one ATM liter equals to 101.3 joules, okay? So we're gonna go ahead and do a work problem here. I'll write it out, write the formula out again, and then we'll do a problem together. Work equals to minus P delta V. This is going to be called external. I got it right neatly. Pressure and ATM and that's and uh, change in volume in liters. So it's change in volume is V final minus V initial. Okay. Now, um, 101.3 joules equals to one ATM. That's conversion. All right, let's go ahead and calculate the work to inflate a balloon. To inflate a balloon, you must do pressure volume work on the surrounding if you inflate a balloon from 0.100 liter to 1.85 liter against an external pressure. So the external pressure for us right now is 1 ATM. That's where we're at. Pressure 1.00 ATM. How much work is done? So work equals P, negative P delta V. What's my negative P? Negative 1.00 ATM. Delta V will be 1.85 liter minus 0.100. Okay, you get negative 1.75 ATM liter, which is going to be converted to joules. will be one, negative 177 joules. When you say negative, that means you do work on the surrounding, okay? All right, so we were just talking about this. We say delta E, change in energy of the system can be measured by Q plus W, right? So what's the formula for Q again? Q equals to MCST 
work is negative. I'll just write down work equals negative p delta v. Okay. Now there's something else we're going to talk about now. It's called a bomb calorimeter. meter. Um, we call it a bomb calorimeter meter because um, the volume stays the same and it can increase in pressure in there. The pressure is changing, but the volume is constant. Okay, so we call it bomb calorimeter. meter. I'll show you a picture of it. In a bomb calorimeter, delta V equals zero. So when delta V equals zero, so work equals zero. This whole term is zero, okay? So delta E equals to Q plus W and that's zero. So delta E equals to Q in a bomb calorimeter. So they ask you, what's the energy change of the system? They're really asking you, what's the heat of the system? Okay? So that's what we are going to work on. I'll show you a picture of it first. Yeah, here this is right here. It says the surroundings is called a bomb, uh, a bomb color meter. It's an insulated container filled with water. Q is surrounding Q color meter is Q system. We'll talk about this here. Um, but it says here E of the system equals the Q of the system because work is zero. We just talked about that, okay? And then, um, so in a bomb calorimeter, you do a reaction. The reaction is the system. I gotta resume this a little bit. So the reaction is the system here. When you do the reaction right there, um, it's in a tightly sealed bomb because you know you can increase the pressure. That's why things bombs blow up. But um, this is not gonna blow up. It's just called a bomb calorimeter because the volume does not change. So it's tightly sealed here and it will increase in temperature, okay? So the, the, the amount of heat that it increases depends on the calorimeter, um, bomb calorimeter constant. So C cal is the um, capacity, heat capacity of the calorimeter itself, okay? And they're saying this calorimeter here is specifically a half, like it takes so much joules per to raise it by one Celsius. So it depends on the calorimeter itself. So they will have to give you this value or they can ask you to calculate it. But that's basically the reaction in here. This reaction is either gonna take up heat or release heat. And whatever the heat is exchanged in here is gonna be reflected in the water in the bomb calorimeter. And you will see the, um, the change in the water temperature. And that's what we're measuring. Okay, so when you do a calculation for bomb calorimeter, remember, um, if they ask you for um, internal energy, the delta E of the system or the delta E of the reaction, they're really asking for the Q of the reaction, okay? And remember, the Q of the reaction, because this is tightly sealed, there's no heat loss anywhere, um, they're saying here, um, the calorimeter, if the, if the system releases heat, if the energy is leaving the reaction, the calorimeter will take it all in because the calorimeter is the surrounding and the surrounding is filled with water. So we technically can't calculate the, the change in temperature of the water and, and based on the calorimeter uh, constant, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and show you a problem. We'll do, I think we'll do a couple problems here. Well, actually, I forgot to do one problem. I'm gonna do, uh, no, actually, we did that already. Yeah, we did, the, we did that. Okay, we're good. Okay. Let's do a problem now. Oh, zoom back out. What was that? So I guess we gotta put this straight away. Q of the reaction. Delta E and Q is the same thing when you talk about bomb calorie. So we are going to talk about sucrose combustion. When a sample of 1.010 grams of sucrose, C12, H22, O11, undergoes combustion 
in a bomb calorimeter. So remember, all combustion releases energy, okay? Because, you know, when you burn something, it always feels hot on the outside. You stand around the fire, it gets hot because the, the burning process is releasing heat to you, okay? So um, they do the combustion in a bomb calorimeter and the temperature rises. So inside the temperate, um, bomb calorimeter is water, right? So the temperature rises. So it says the temperature rises from 24.92 Celsius to 28.33 Celsius. Find delta E reaction for the combustion of sucrose in units of kilojoules per moles sucrose. So they're very specific here in what unit they want. So you have to make sure you calculate in kilojoules per moles of sucrose. So once you get the kilojoules or the joules and you turn the kilojoules, you have to divide by the moles of sucrose. So you're gonna need, because you need moles of sucrose, you have grams here, you're gonna need molar mass of sucrose. So C of the calorimeter, we needed that, is going to be 4.90 kilojoules per Celsius. And then molar mass of sucrose you can calculate it based on the formula, and that's going to be equal to 342.3 grams per mole. Okay? All right, so let's go ahead and do this. Q of the calorimeter equals to the opposite of Q of the reaction. And I know the Q of the reaction is going to be a negative sign. Calorimeter is going to be a positive sign. Plus, I can see that the temperature is going up anyway. So um, that equals to... Uh, C of the calorimeter times the delta T of the calorimeter, which was 4.90 kilojoules per Celsius. And what was the temperature change? It was 28.33 Celsius minus 24.92 Celsius. So get that answer right there. And that's going to give you uh, heat of the calorimeter as 16.7 kilojoules. So Q of the calorimeter is opposite sign for the reaction, remember? So I can say Q of the reaction, therefore, is going to be negative 16.7 kilojoules. And isn't that the same as delta E of the reaction? Yes, it is. But is this the correct unit? No, it's only kilojoules for 1.010 grams. They want you to do it in moles of sucrose. So you got to take this kilojoules divide by the moles of sucrose. Well, I don't have the moles of sucrose right now, I have it in grams, but I can go ahead and um, change it to grams. So this is 16.7 kilojoules will be released if you burn exactly 1.010 grams of sucrose. They want you to give a general term where if you actually burn one mole of sucrose, how many kilojoules would that be? So a simple solution is really just take this and divide this by that amount of sucrose in moles, okay? So I'll write this down, divide by 1.010 grams sucrose in terms of moles, okay? So let's go ahead and convert that. Um, 1.010 grams of sucrose, molar mass, one mole, is 342.3 grams and that will be 2.951 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of sucrose so then all i do is plug that value in there so delta e of the reaction is now negative 16.7 kilojoules divided by 2.951 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of sucrose and then my answer will be in kilojoules per moles of sucrose. It's negative 5.66 times 10 to the power of 3 kilojoules per moles of sucrose. Ta -da. All right, that's how you read that question. Let's do another bomb calorimeter question, okay? 
this one here, now, instead of asking you to find the E, they're gonna ask you to calculate the C count. Okay, so let's try that. So I'm just showing you a variety of questions that you could potentially see. Let's try this. It says A, 21.8 grams of ethanol. So ethanol is C2H5OH. Is burned in a bomb calorie meter. Oh, that has a heat capacity of 23.3 .3 kilojoules per Celsius. So every heat, uh, bomb calorimeter is going to be different, okay? Um, this one here is 23.3 .3 kilojoules per Celsius, and it says if the temperature rose from 35.0 Celsius to 76.0 Celsius, what is the value? You know what? I just wrote the wrong question. Hold on. I lied. Now, I'm going to change it. Yeah, we don't want to do this question. Hi, Pat. Because that, that's a rip. Um, that's something that do we just do. So I totally wrote the wrong question. Sorry about that. Hope you weren't writing. If you were, sorry. Hope you have light out. Okay, my bad. Let's do the question I meant to do for you guys. We burn that ethanol. And we're, I was told you we were looking for the Z cow. I don't know why I wrote the other question. So um, if the temperature rises from 25.0 Celsius to 62.3 Celsius, determine the heat capacity of the calorimeter. Molar mass of ethanol is 46.07 grams per mole. Because if I had done the other question, it would be literally the same type of problem we just worked. So we don't want to have to do that again. We can do that in class when we're practicing problems. But let's focus on this one. Now we want to do C cal. So Q cal equals to um, negative Q of reaction. Okay. Um, but we didn't need that because now we're only going to calculate the Q-Cal. So the Q-Cal alone, um, the negative reaction is for the methanol right there. Okay, so the Q-Cal is going to be C of the calorimeter times delta T. And we're looking for C-Cal. Oh yeah, I have to give you this value here. Let me write this question out in that equation. C2H5OH plus 3O2 equals to 2CO2 plus 3H2. So that's combustion. Every time your combustion is plus oxygen equals carbon dioxide plus water. And this is delta H of the reaction, uh, which is what we're about to see. So this is basically the energy for this reaction right here, okay? So this is delta H is negative one, two, three, five kilojoules, okay? So what you wanna go ahead and do here 
is that value here is kilojoules per one mole of ethanol right there. Okay. So we'll actually do this question right after, but we're gonna go ahead and show you. So this delta H here is for this reaction stoichiometry wise, it's for one mole of ethanol, for three moles of oxygen, for two moles of carbon dioxide, and three moles of water. That's why earlier when we were recording this one here, we had it per mole of sucrose. So this one here is gonna be per mole of um, ethanol right here. Okay, so we have CCal and delta T. We have the delta T value is 62.3 Celsius minus 25.0 Celsius. And then we are looking for the CCal, so we need to go ahead and calculate the QCal. So the QCal here is gonna be found from this value here, okay? So this is value per one mole of ethanol. Do we know how many moles of ethanol I have? Well, I know it's 21.8 grams, so let's go ahead and change the grams of ethanol Two moles of ethanol. One mole is uh, 46.07 grams. And then I'm going to get moles as, um, put that in. Zero point four seven three one nine. Okay, and then I know the energy here is per mole, so I'm going to go ahead and say if I have this amount of moles of ethanol, I'm going to go ahead and continue the math here, and I know uh, I can get negative one, two, three, five kilojoules of energy every time I burn one mole of ethanol. Okay, take that number times one, two, three, five. I'm gonna get a negative 584.39 uh, kilojoules here. But see, I'm stuck at the third number. I really stopped at 584. So I know it's 584 uh, kilojoules here. So I'm gonna take this negative 584. Okay, that's my Q of reaction. Okay. And then that means my Q of calorie meter is going to be positive 584. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So Q calorie meter is therefore positive 584 uh, kilojoules. And that equals to C cal times uh, the delta T there, which was um, 30, 37.3 Celsius. So CCal is going to be 584 divided by 37.3, and that's going to give me 15.7 kilojoules per Celsius. Okay, so that's how we would solve that one. So in this case here, we kind of had a preview of the next section, so it's kind of cool, like, um, it's kind of stoichiometry, I guess. It tells you, like, this one is per mole of that, so you can calculate the energy. So that's how we get um, Q with the reaction, and we know it's the opposite sign, and we go to Q cal. All right, so let's go to the next part. Whoa, sorry. Where we see the delta H sign, okay? ta -da. What in the world wants a delta H stuff? Well, showed you a quick little pre uh, preview. So enthalpy is the sum of energy, uh, internal energy of the system, which is the E. We, we just calculated the energy of the system and the product of pressure and volume. It's also a state function just like E was, okay? So delta H equals the delta E plus P delta V. And they tell you, um, Basically, delta H equals to Q at constant pressure. Remember how earlier delta E equals to Q at constant volume because volume doesn't change in a volume calorie meter? So it's kind of cool. Heat can represent many things. Heat, Q is the same thing as delta E of the system in a volume calorie meter. Q is the same thing as delta H of their system at constant pressure. 
we're just we are always at constant pressure because our pressure is not changing right now okay so um a and e are pretty similar in value um so we want to go ahead and talk about um signs of delta h now okay so i'll have um this here we'll write it out um on a piece of paper here and then i wanted to show you um how we can look at uh, endothermic versus exothermic so don't i don't worry actually let's go ahead and write this out real quick oh we're talking about delta h right what in the world delta h delta h equals to delta e plus p delta b okay enthalpy is the sum of internal energy and product of literally this equation of pressure and volume. So at constant pressure, delta H equals to delta E plus P delta V and work equals to negative p delta v, remember? This was a separate thing from earlier. So delta h equals to q plus work, remember? That was the formula right there. And then that over here, p delta v, is basically the opposite, so it will be minus work. This turns to work. Okay? So it's Q work minus work. So at constant pressure, delta H equals to just Q. Okay. So we wanna talk about plus minus signs. Endothermic is plus sign, exothermic is minus sign. So how are we gonna remember this? Endo is indoors, money coming in is plus sign, exo is exiting, money leaving is negative sign. That's how you remember your bank account. Money come in, plus sign, money go out, negative sign, okay? So endothermic is um, heat flowing into the system, money goes in, delta H is positive, endothermic feels cold to the touch. Why does it feel cold to the touch? When you're touching, you're touching the surrounding, like say if you're touching a flask that got cold or you're doing a reaction. Um, so for this lab here, um, when we're doing thermochemistry lab, there are some solids that we have to throw in water to dissolve it and we can measure the temperature change. Some of these solids will actually cool your test tube water down a lot. So that is an endothermic reaction and it feels cold to the touch. The reason why it gets colder is because the reaction was sucking in energy from the, the solution, which was the surrounding, from the water, okay? So the water got colder because it provided heat to um, fuel the reaction. So that's why it feels cold to the touch. Now, exothermic feels warm to the touch because like if you stand outside a fire, don't you feel hot? Because it's releasing heat to you. If it's sucking heat, you'll feel cold. Okay, so exothermic is money leaving out of the system. Well, it's actually heat, not money, but I like to use money as an analogy because it's you, everyone knows how to read a bank account statement. So eight delta H will be negative. Exothermic feels warm to the touch. Don't touch the fire, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at some examples here. See if we can decide if it's positive or negative sign. So it says here, identify if it's endothermic or exothermic, indicate the sign of delta H. Sweat evaporating from skin. The first one, so you don't, sweat evaporating skin, when you sweat and sweat evaporates, don't you feel cold? That's how our body is cooling ourselves down. What is the process though? The process, the system is sweat evaporating and sweat is changing from liquid phase to gas phase, okay? So liquid to gas phase, is going to give you a, um, what, what change is that? From liquid going to gas. So I'm gonna go ahead and write this out for you. Mm, I think it's a pencil. 
Two. Solid liquid gas, liquid is energy here, gas is higher energy. So sweat evaporating is going up, see that? So when it's going up like that, what sign is it? Delta H is positive sign and it's endothermic. That one's positive, endothermic. Water freezing in the freezer. When water is freezing, it's from liquid going to solid, agree? It's coming down. So what sign is that? It's money coming down, money leaving the account, delta H is negative sign. That's exothermic. Wood burning in the fire is not a phase change, so we don't have to draw it out like that. Wood burning, it feels hot on the out when you're standing on the outside, so it's gonna be exothermic because it feels warm, not to the touch, but just because you're in the surrounding. Okay? So that's how you would be able to tell endo versus exo. Um, there will be multiple examples, dynamic study modules, homework questions, quizzes, and test questions on this. So make sure you practice. Okay, so let's keep doing more slides. Here's a part where we were talking earlier, um, enthalpy of a reaction. In the question that we just did, you know how we just had to do um, combustion of um, ethanol, right? So this one here is going to be propane. Propane tank combustion is C3H8 plus five oxygen goes to three carbon dioxide and four water. And you see how it releases energy? It's 2044 kilojoules um, per moles of propane. What was it for ethanol earlier? Ethanol is 1235. So burning of ethanol releases smaller energy per mole of ethanol than it does propane. So propane gives a bigger punch, basically. Okay, per mole, okay? per mole of propane. So um, one mole of propane will release 2044 kilojoules. So you can do this ratio here. Um, either moles or kilojoules on the top of water, it depends on your math at what you need, but that's the relationship there. And then you can also say it's 2044 per five moles of oxygen, 2044 per three moles of carbon dioxide, 2044 per four moles of water. Typically, it's going to be the thing that you can combust. Okay, so let's take a look and we can calculate for propane. So earlier we did it for ethanol, right? And we used the ethanol question to do bomb calorimeter question right here, right there. So I want to do one for propane tank. So we have a tank, an LP gas tank, has 13.2 kilograms of propane, C3H8. Calculate the heat in kilojoules associated with complete combustion of all the propane in the tank. This would be a big explosion if you combusted all of it at the same time. So it was C3H8 plus 5O2 going to 3CO2 plus for H2O and a delta H for this reaction with negative 2044 kilojoules. So you notice they don't say kilojoules per mole, they, it's, it's implied per mole of this guy, per five moles of this, per three moles of that, and four moles of that. So molar mass of propane. is 44.09 grams per mole. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and calculate for 13.2 kilograms of propane. That's a lot of propane. 13.2 kilograms is heavy. 1,000 grams is found in one kilogram. One mole of propane 
weighs 44.09 grams. And then one mole of propane releases negative 2044 kilojoules of energy. That would be our final answer that we're looking for. So it's going to be negative 6.12 times 10 to the power of 5 kilojoules. That's a lot of energy with the combustion of the entire tank. It's not going to be close by when that happens. All right, so let's get going. We want to talk about the, because earlier we were talking about bomb calorimeter, right? Now we want to talk about coffee cup calorimeter. So coffee cup calorimeter is, um, I guess, styrofoam coffee cups. And then we try to do our best to not let it lose energy, but you know, it's not perfect. So it will lose some energy sometimes. So depending on the question, if they don't tell you the calorimeter, um, um, number, they're saying that that guy does not lose energy, assume no loss of heat to the surrounding, no loss of energy, heat transfer to your surrounding, it's completely insulated. That's the assumption. If it's not completely insulated, they'll have to give you the value for the uh, calorimeter so you can calculate the loss of energy there. Okay, but if they don't give it to you, that means assume no heat loss, no, everything's perfectly insulated. Okay. So it's done in constant pressure because we're in a constant pressure environment. So that means Q is going to be the same as delta H. Q of the reaction is the same as delta H of the reaction, which then once you get delta H and Q of the reaction is the opposite sign for the solution in the coffee cup calorimeter. Okay, so that is what we will be doing. And a lot of times your delta H if they want you per mole, just divide by the moles of the item that you're doing. Okay, if not, it's just per amount of whatever you're using. So they typically want you to convert it per mole of whatever you're using. So let's go ahead and do a problem there. Let me write it out. Mm, we have space here. Let's go ahead and move the next page, okay? Change page here. So, MG solid plus 2HCl. This reaction is super fun. It's like magic. MG just disappears. It's super like um, exothermic because it releases so much heat and water gets so hot. Um, so I guess they're asking you to calculate the, the heat of this reaction here. It's so fun when you guys get to do it. You actually get to do it in the first week of class, so you already did it. Um, okay, so let's see. To determine the enthalpy change of this reaction, we combine so we combine 0 0.158 grams of magnesium with just enough HCl to make 100 milliliter of solution in a coffee cup calorie. Okay, um, assume all the magnesium here reacts, okay? Um, it's a complete reaction. We're not gonna talk about this excess. We have exact amounts of everything that's reacted. And then it says the temperature of the solution rises from 25.6 Celsius to 32.8 Celsius. It will go up. It's like super fun to look, um, to do the experiment as a result. But because you guys do it on your first week, you're not measuring the temperature, but you will feel a bit hot. It says fine delta H reaction 
and units of joules per moles magnesium. Use 1.00 grams per mole as density of uh, solution and 4.18 joules per gram Celsius as CS of solution. It's really the same number as water because it is an aqueous. It's in water. Okay, so in this case here, remember. Uh, Q of the reaction is the opposite sign of Q of the solution. And I know it was an exothermic reaction. How can I see it's exothermic? Well, it's releasing heat to the surrounding, the solution, the hot solution will be positive and the reaction will be a negative sign. But we are going to go ahead and calculate the solution value. And then we know that the reaction will be the opposite sign. So a solution is 100 grams because 100 grams at one uh, one grams per mil is going to be 100 mil, so 100 grams here of the solution. Um, CS will be 4.18 joules per gram Celsius, and the Celsius will be 32.8 Celsius minus 25.6 Celsius for the delta T. Okay, so that's Q M C S delta T. I mean Q M C S delta T. All right, so we got that part. Um, this here ends up being 7.2 Celsius. So Q solution equals to 3.0 times 10 to the power of 3 joules because of this guy being two sig figs right there. Okay, so that means Q of the reaction is going to be the opposite sign, negative 3.0 times 10 to the power of 3 joules. So in this question here, they didn't say, um, that it lost any energy to the surrounding, we are assuming it's completely insulated here. Okay, because it's completely insulated, they're just going to be opposite signs here, like that. If it wasn't, they'll tell you a value for the calorie meter as well. Okay, but they didn't do it here, so because it's like that, that's easier. Uh, I'll show you uh, some problems that, that has that value where it's not a perfectly insulated situation. So in this case here, that's the value, that's also the delta H of the reaction. Now, what did you did that they want you to have? Uh, they want it in joules per moles of magnesium. This is just in joules for 0 0.158 grams of magnesium. So we want to go ahead and change this in terms of moles. Okay, so we have to go ahead and change um, 0.158 grams of magnesium to moles first. So 0 0.158 grams of magnesium. One mole of magnesium weighs 24.31 grams based on a periodic table. And you'll get 6.50 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of magnesium. And then you need to stick that in there, okay? So the delta H of the reaction officially is going to be negative 3.0 times 10 to the power of 3 joules divided by 6.50, oh, you can't see, times 10 to the minus 3 moles of magnesium. So it will be equals to negative 4.6 times 10 to the power of 5 joules per moles of magnesium. Okay? And typically, it is actually reported as kilojoules per mole. So um, if you saw this reaction here, like they would actually write it in a book like this. I'll show you. 2HCl going to MgCl2. I'll write it up here. There's a 2 here. I got a 2. AQ plus H2. And then they'll say delta H equals to negative 4.6 times 10 to the power of 2 kilojoules. Because that's in kilojoules would be 10 to the power of 2. Okay, because it's 1,000 to 1. And then that's kilojoules per mole of magnesium right there. That's how they were reported in the book. Ta -da! So that's that. Now we want to do two more where it's not um, perfectly insulated, okay? It's not perfectly insulated. Um, 
we'll just basically have an extra term here. So that means like uh, the, the heat loss there is, you see how over here the reaction uh, was lost to complete the solution. And then we'll have to counter in the another extra loss for the kilocalorimeter because it wasn't perfectly insulated. But you know, a lot of times we just assume it's perfectly insulated unless they tell us the value for it. Then we know it's not perfectly insulated. Okay, so let's work on those problems. So you can see how it reads. So the first one it says a student is preparing to perform a series of calorimetry experiments. She first wishes to determine the heat capacity of the calorimeter of her coffee cup calorimeter. Okay, so a student is trying to determine not how you spell cup. All right. So what experiment does she do? So let me describe to you the experiment. It's really easy to find this out. So she pours 50.0 milliliters of water at 72.0 Celsius into the calorimeter containing 50.0 mils of water at 25.0 Celsius. So it's like hot and cold, right? And then she carefully records. Now, when you guys are doing your experiment in lab, if you're in my lab, we are going to assume our calorimeter is magic and it's completely insulated. So we're not going to do this part. But you could. You could do it and figure out that, um, you know, my calorimeter is actually very not efficient. So why are we doing this? So anyway, this is what she's doing. She's calculating the CCAL, okay? And when we do ours, because our, depending on the set up for each campus is very different. Some campuses have better equipment than others, so it's better CCAL. Some of them are really, really bad CCAL value, like huge difference. So, um, and that changes from student to student, group to group. So it's very high variable here, okay? But still a fun experiment, drop hot metal into cold water, see the temperature difference. It's just a good application of calculation. The labs are fun. All right, she carefully records um, the final temperature. Of water as 44.0. What is, is the C cow? for the calorie. Okay, so if it was perfectly insulated, it would have smack been in the middle of 25 and 72. Okay, because it's the exact same amount. So it would have been 72 plus 25 divided by two. It would have been 48.5. Guess what? Not all of it was there. Some of it left the calorimeter and it turned out to be 44. So it did lose some heat. So the, we said the calorimeter absorbed some of that heat there. And that's why you saw a different temperature than you were expected to see. If you were expecting it to be perfectly insulated, it would have been 72 plus 25 divided by two. It would have been 48.5 degrees, okay? So because we know that, we are going to say this equation here. So. Q of the hot water is losing the heat, right? And if it was perfectly insulated, all of it would have been absorbed by the cold. That would have been it. But because it's not perfectly insulated, we saw this, it's because part of it ran away um, from the calorimeter not being very efficient. You count right there. 
Okay, and we are going to find out this decal from here. So we will know the Q uh, cold and hot, cold and hot values in the calorimeter. Um, cold and calorimeter equals to the hot value. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate the the hot here. So I'll write down the equation here. So it's negative 50 grams. Again, why 50 grams? Because water is one grams per mil, so 50 mils is 50 grams, okay? So, and then 4.18 um, joules per gram Celsius. And then what's the temperature difference? Um, 44 and 72, right? So 44 minus 72. You get negative 28.0 Celsius. And then, remember this, this is a cold one now. So 50 grams again, because we did use 50 grams of water. And then 4.18. And then what's my delta T? It was uh, 44 and 25. So that gives me uh, 19. That's my delta T, okay? Plus, I'm going to write down the CCAL and my delta T of the CCAL, it was the same. Also, and the CCAL was uh, the same number as whatever the water that was in the calorimeter. So it was 19 also. Okay, so you can solve for the CCAL right here. So get the answer here, get the answer here, and then we can solve for CCAL. So the CCAL, is going to end up being 99.1 joules per Celsius over here. Okay, so this is one, one term in calculator, that's one term in calculator, and then put those two terms together and then divide it by 19 Celsius, you get 99.1 joules per Celsius. So make sure you are able to get that on your calculator. All right, so let's do another question with the calorimeter. With, with the coffee cup calorimeter not being completely efficient. So it says here are two solutions. Initially, at 24.60, zero Celsius are mixed in a coffee cup calorimeter. So it's not efficient, so they tell you to seek out. The cal equals to 15.5 joules per Celsius. 15.5 is a better calorimeter than 99.1. Because 99.1 means a lot of heat is being lost, okay? So, um, and then you have that, and it says when a 100 mil volume of 0 0.100 molarity AgNO3, what's the name for AgNO3? Silver nitrate solution is mixed with a 100.0 mil sample of 0 0.200 molarity in a Cl sodium chloride. The temperature rises to 25.30 Celsius. Determine Delta H reaction for the reaction as written below. So as written below, it's gonna be per mole of the stuff, okay? So let's take a look here. The reaction was NaCl plus AgNO3 equals to AgCl plus NaNO3. 
So what kind of reaction is this? This is a precipitation reaction. Don't forget, two weeker solution. This one precipitated, got married. And that one's always zero later. It's always in the dating pool. Okay. So in this case here, they want you to find uh, your Q of the reaction per um, one mole of silver nitrate or per one mole of NaCl, depending which one you can use either one. Okay. I will go ahead and uh, you have to determine who's the limiting one here. So let's see um, how can you tell who's limiting. So 100 mils of 0.1, 100 mils of 0.2, agree? Which one you have more of? Um, NaCl will be double the amount of AgNO3. So this one here is limiting. Reacted um, because the mole is 0 0.1, um, 0 0.1 a liter, 100 mils divided by 1,000, right? So it's 0 0.1 um, liter times um, 0 0.1 moles per one liter. So AgNO3 was 0 0.0100 moles. And this guy here will be double it. Okay, I promise you if you do the math, it's gonna be 0 0.0200 mole. So this one is excess. This one is limiting. Wow, man. This is so weird. No, it has to happen to you more now. There we go. Now I got extra piece hanging out. I used to have a liquid paper it out, but those were messy. This one's much easier. Anyway, so we have that, okay? So once you, they want you to calculate the delta H, which is the Q. After you get the Q, you wanna divide by this mole here because that's your limiting. How do I know the limiting? It's because it's one mole to one mole to one mole to one mole. It's so easy. So um, 0 0.01 moles of AgNO3 will form 0 0.01 of this, 0 0.01 of mole of that. This one would have potentially formed 0 0.02 and 0 0.02, but obviously we know that's impossible because once you make 0 0.01, you run out of a silver nitrate, you can't go anymore. Okay? So it's kind of like a pizza situation. You can't make or five pizzas because you only have three pizza crusts. All right, so let's go and find the delta H. So how do you get the delta H? You got the H of the reaction. It's the same thing as Q of the reaction. And the Q of the reaction is going to be, uh, did the temperature go up? Initially is, yeah, 24.6, it goes up, right? So the Q of the reaction is a negative sign. These guys are gonna be negative because the temperature went up because the Q of the solution is positive. And then we have a C cal, so we have a Q cal right here. And that equals to that guy. Because it's not completely e efficient. If it was efficient, we don't have this term, remember? Because it's not completely efficient, they gave you that, you gotta add that term right there, okay? And remember the delta T for this guy is the same as delta T for this guy. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate it. That equals to the solution term, so grams of the solution, how many grams of solution do I have? So um, we are going to assume the, uh, the density is going to be um, um, one grams per mil so also here, so let's go ahead. Density is one grams per mil. So um, 100 mils and 100 mils, 200 mils. That means 200 grams. Mass of the solution, CF of the solution is going to be assumed. Oh, yeah, I should write that down. Because you see how earlier the, what was it this question here? It wasn't this question, the question before that, I told you. Oh, yeah, right okay. here. We're gonna use the same one, okay? Let me write it out. CS 4.1 Celsius. Right there. 
So four upon one angels per gram Celsius. And then delta T was final minus initial. So uh, 25.3 minus 24.6. And that gives you 0 0.7 Celsius. Okay, that's the Q of the solution. And then you're gonna plus Q of the cal, which is 15.5 joules per Celsius. And my Celsius is the same as this guy, 0 0.70 Celsius. So um, that's gonna give you, um, oh yeah, I forgot. Q in the reaction is going to be a negative sign. So, so this here is all going to be negative term. Okay, whatever we get here is going to be the negative sign. This is negative. That's opposite sign of these two guys. Okay, so whatever this is here, let's go ahead and calculate it. That equals these two and that. That turns out to be 596.61 joules. And once we have 596 here, it's really 597. That's positive. So that guy is. Negative five ninety six point six one. Okay, but that is per zero point zero one zero zero moles of AG and O. Since that's my limiting, you have to divide it by the limiting amount. Okay. So we have that. Let's go ahead and divide it, and you'll get your answer as, I'm really running out of space, if you can't tell. Um, I'm just going to do 597, okay? 597 divided by 0 0.01, it's 59700 joules per moles right here of AgNO3. And then let's go ahead and convert kilojoules. If we divide it by a thousand, you get 59.7 by negative, negative 59.72 joules per mole of sulfur nitrate. And that will be my answer right there. Negative 59.7, okay? Kilojoules. So that's that if you had to do the QCAL if it's not completely efficient. So they all have to tell if they don't give you the CCAL or the QCAL, you know it's completely insulated, assume there's no loss, and you can just do this simple one. It's exactly the opposite, okay? If it is not, then you have to uh, take into account whatever the difference is. Q solution and QCAL, get that number, and then the opposite of those two terms added together, would be negative for the actual reaction because it's the opposite sign. Okay, so let's keep moving. Now the next part we want to talk about is Hess's law. Yes, we're going to do Hess's law. So this is called Hess's law. Okay, so Let's take a look at the slide here. This is slide number 41. When you have this reaction, C and O2 going to CO2, and then because delta H is a state function, but it's extensive property, if you have double the C, double the O2, double the CO2, you have to multiply double the energy, okay? And then if you reversed it, like CO2 and C and O2, versus C and, C and O2 going to CO2, you'll have to flip the sign. That, that's easily understood because over here, 
in the first slide, actually, let me just show you the first slide. Because my drawing is not that pretty. I'll show you the slide. Where was that in the beginning? Right here. So how we said like um, C and O2 going to CO2 is coming down as a negative sign. And then if CO2 going up, it will be a positive sign. Okay, so you see CO2 is a positive, going to C and O2 is positive. C and O2 going to CO2 is a negative sign. Because it's just literally the same uh, distance, but opposite directions. Okay, now if you add multiple steps together to get um, the overall step, you have to add the delta H of each step. So if you take A plus 2B going to C and then C going to 2D, if you wanted to do from A plus 2B to D directly, you can actually get delta H of the first step plus delta H of the second step. You will get the answer for the overall. Okay? So let's go ahead and apply this because it's like right now it's just a bunch of words. You don't really know what I'm talking about. So we have to practice. Hess's law is a lot of practice. The University of New York work. Sorry if you can hear it, but it's supposed to be able to filter it out. Hess's law. So we want to go ahead and do this work. So remember, if you multiply a reaction, you multiply the delta H. If you, I actually let me write it off. If we multiply the reaction, we multiply delta H with the same factor, whatever it is. If we times two, that times two. If we flip a reaction, we flip the delta H sign, okay? If we add a few reaction steps together, we add all the delta H values together. Those were the summaries from the previous slide we just saw. Okay, so uh, find delta H reaction for 3C plus 4H2 going to C3H8. So this is delta H. I don't know what this is. And then they say, use these reactions for the known H's. So there is a part on your textbook on the appendix. You'll have to look up useful data on your e-text on the appendix uh, in the back of the book when you're doing this. If you don't have these values, um, they should be given during your test. But basically, in the back of the book, there's these all these crazy values you can imaginable. But this one here is actually in a really big book that has all the reactions that they recorded, all the delta H values. Kind of crazy, but here they are. Here are some known values, okay? So they know line one, they say they know that C3H8 plus 5O2 going to 3CO2 plus 4H2. Remember, this was a combustion of propane. And they say this is delta H is negative 2043 kilojoules. It was funny because the other page said 2044. But uh, close enough. Uh, line two says C plus O2 going to uh, CO2. This one here was already also reported. We knew it was negative 393.5 kilojoules. And then the third line that's known is 2H2 plus O2 goes to 2H2O. And that value for delta H is going to be negative 483.6 kilojoules. Okay. So what you want to do here is it's sort of like um, using these three steps here to solve for a jigsaw puzzle, okay? So your jigsaw puzzle is basically, you know, when you get a jigsaw puzzle, you see the picture on the box and you kind of know what you're looking for, okay? And your box tells you this is the final picture up there, okay? And you have all these random pieces in the box correct? 
So my idea is do the easiest pieces first. We always do the edges first because they're easier. You can kind of see what color they should be. And if they are missing one side, one side's flat, you just do all the edges first. So once you get the edges, you start filling in the middle. Agree? So our strategy again is to use the easiest way to do this. So my easiest example is to pick a piece that only appears once. So the easiest one would be like two edges, right? This corner here, the four corners, because because they're missing um, curly. Um, they they only have um, two parts that are like random edges. So so when you can find those edges, the corners right there, those are the easiest pieces. That's what we're after. Okay. So the goal is if I have three carbon, four hydrogen, and C3H8, I'm trying to match. You have to pick only things that don't repeat itself. The things that repeat itself are the confusing ones. I don't want to use those. So for example, I don't want to use oxygen because it repeats itself in three lines. That is so confusing. Carbon dioxide repeats itself in two lines. That's confusing. Water repeats itself in two lines. That's so confusing. I don't want to do that. I don't want to use these guys here, but there's only one C3H8 that's appearing here. So this is my only chance. This is like my corner piece to fit in my puzzle. And I know it has to fit on the product side. So I know I had one mold and it had to fit on the product side. So the thing is, I have to correct a mold number of molds, correct? How can I make these, this piece here go over there? So all I have to do is for line one, I have to flip it. I don't have to multiply with any number because the number of moles is already correct. So all I do is flip it. So line one, go ahead and flip. When you flip it, what does it look like? It looks like 3CO2 plus 4H2O, and then it goes to C3H8 plus 5O2. When you flip a reaction, what do you do with the delta H? You flip the sign. So it's positive 2043 here. Okay, so that's that. And then for line two, uh, let's take a look at what we want to use. You can't use O2 and CO2 because they repeat. They're so confusing. So for line two, I'm going to use C carbon, and it's on the correct side. But it's the wrong number. How many numbers do we need? I need three. So what do I do? I take line two and times three. I don't want to flip it because it's already on the correct side. But I need to multiply by three because I need the moles to match. So I get 3C plus 3O2 goes to 3CO2, agree? And then because you multiply by three, your delta H also gets multiplied by three. So it's three times negative 393.5 kilojoules. Okay, now let's go to line three. So I said we don't want to use that and that. So we can use H2. Is H2 on the correct side? Yes, it looks like it's on the correct side, but is it a correct number? No, it's not. How do you get two to turn into four? Easy peasy times two. So now I get 4H2 plus 2O2 plus F times two equals to 4H2O. It literally just times the whole reaction. So delta H here is going to be two times negative 483.6. Now, when you do this recipe that I teach you, I promise you when you add these lines up, it will add up to the answer. If you didn't add it up to the right answer, you made a mistake somewhere, check your work, okay? So all I wanna do now is add them up. So I like to circle who's my product, who's my reactants. Add them up. Okay, I don't have to write products and reactants appearing on both sides, they cancel off. So you see here, three CO2, cancels off with three, three CO2, that crosses off. They're on opposite sides. I have five oxygens here. I have five oxygen here. They cancel off too. And then I have um, four waters on both sides. They cancel off too. So what's left over? Three C plus four H2 goes to C3 H8. What do you know? It matches exactly. So the delta H for this would be to add all these guys up. Add all this guy up and you will get your answer is negative 104.7 kilojoules. And that's how you do Hess's law, okay? So let's do some more to practice. Here's another one. N2O plus NO2 goes to three NO. What's my delta H? I gotta give you the known equations first. So the known equation is one 
2NO plus O2 goes to 2NO2. Delta H equals to negative 113.1 kilojoules. Joules. Line two, N2 plus O2 goes to 2NO. Delta H equals to positive 182.6 kilojoules. Line three, two N O N two O plus equals to two N two plus O two. Delta H equals to negative one sixty three point two kilojoules. Okay, so let's take a look again. We use our same strategy, and we want to figure out which one to use. So let's take a look at line one. What's in line one that only appears in line one, but not repeating in lines two and three? that I can use to fit my puzzle. So the way I see it, um, I think I wanna go ahead and match this NO guy, because N, actually NO repeats, so never mind, I don't wanna do that. NO repeats, O2 repeats, so that's not good. NO2, this is NO2 and there's no NO2 anywhere, so I'm gonna go ahead and use this guy, okay? Because that one repeats, that's no good. So let's work on this guy, NO2. And I need, I have two moles on a product side. I need one mole on a reactant side. So what do I do? I have to flip it so it goes on the correct side and then I have to times half because I want to make it two go to one. So times half or just divide by two, same thing. I just say times half because I like to keep multiplying because my question, my, my statement up here says it, we, we multiply by the same factor. So you can multiply by half, okay? For line one. So then I flip it so I get NO2 goes to NO plus half O2. Okay, it doesn't matter if you have half here. It'll, 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 it'll work out, I promise. So it'll be half times positive 113.1. Okay, so that's my first one. Let's take a look at line two and you're like, that one repeats, that one repeats, N-O repeats. Everything repeats on line two. That's super confusing. So I'm going to skip that line altogether and go to line three. What's on line three that I can use? Uh, N2 repeats, O3 repeats. So I want to use N2O, okay? Is my N2O on the correct side? Yes, it's on the correct side, but it's on the wrong amount. I got to half it. So times half for line three. So I get N2O equals to N2 plus half of O2. My delta H now is half times um, negative 163.2 kilojoules. Agree? So now that we have that, um, we got that settled. So now we have to see N2O2 and N2 and know how that works. So let's take a look at what we have now. I have one mole of oxygen on the um, product side right now. See how if I added them all together, this has one mole, right? And then I also have nitrogen on the product side. I have one nitrogen and one oxygen on the product side, and they don't appear up here. So that means line two has to cancel those guys out. So that means I need N2 and O2 on my line two to be on the reactant side. So I can cancel out these guys. See that? So, ta-da! Doesn't that match exactly? So I'm gonna keep line two the same, and then I'm gonna do equals to two and O, keep the delta H the same. So that is positive 182.6 kilojoules. Now, if we add everybody up, I promise you, when we add all this up, Let's see what cancels off. I just told you, right? We cancel this one off. We cancel N2 off. What do we get? We get that up. We get NO2 plus N2O. Doesn't matter if it's back, backwards, this is the same thing, okay? Equals to NO, and there's three of them. Ta-da, it matches exactly up here. So all these three here added up will give you the answer. And this one's going to be positive 157.55 kilojoules. So that's how you do that. So let's do one more example for Hess's Law.
You got this. You can do this. This is all super fun. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. Oop, not H2, it's H2. I'm too excited there. Three H two plus O three goes to three H two O. Delta H equals to something we don't know. So line one, two H two plus O two goes to two H two O. Delta H equals to negative four eighty three point six kilojoules. Line two, three O two going to two O three. Delta H equals to positive 285.4 kilojoules. Okay, so let's take a look at line one. What do you want to use? Line one, uh, I want to use H2 and H2O, right? The correct side, but wrong number. How do you make two turn into three? U times three over two, okay? So then you get three H2 plus three over two O three O two, three H2 O. And then Delta H is three over two times negative 483.6. So that's the first line, okay? And then line two, uh, we want to do O3, we want to flip it to, to the reactant side and we want to half it. So two goes to one. So flip times half. So we get O3 goes to three over two, O2. Delta H equals to half times negative 285.4 kilojoules. We add them up. So you see 302 and 302 cancels off on the opposite side. So 3H2 plus O3 goes to 3H2O. And the answer total up would be negative 868.1 kilojoules. Ta-da! And that's how you would do Hess's law. Okay? So we got a little bit more. Hang in there, hang in there. Okay, after Hess's law, we want to talk about standard conditions because we want to talk about standard heat of formation. So standard condition for a gas law, remember we said it was 1 atm and 273 kelvin. So, but for our chapter for thermochemistry is 1 atm and our temperature usually is at 25 degrees. If we have a solution, it's going to be one molarity and uh, the standard state is going to be pure solid or liquid in this most stable state most stable form at 1 atm so it has to be pure element at its most stable form at 1 atm okay and if it's gas it's exactly 1 atm pressure solid and liquid will be in its most stable form at 1 atm the temperature is typically 25 degrees and the concentration of solution at standard will be one molarity so when it's standard we we label it as a not sign we have that little dot not sign on the top so delta h not means standard there's a, a table in your appendix a delta h f formation standard so this is standard enthalpy formation so this table here is a formation values anything that's a stand, um, pure element and its most stable form will have a zero kilojoules per mole delta h f not that's by definition, okay? Elements must be in their standard states. For pure element, it will be zero kilojoules per mole, uh, the most stable form anyway. So let's show you some um, tables. You don't have to memorize this, but you do need to know who's zero, okay? So zeros are the most stable form of the element. So for bromine, uh, it's gonna be a liquid um, form here that's zero, Br2. And then all the metals typically is the solid form. And then you see how carbon graphite is zero, but diamond isn't. So the zeros are the most stable form of the pure element. The ones that are not zero, because they're not elements and they're not the most stable form. CCL2 gas, so chlorine gas is zero, bromine is liquid. So if you have chlorine, bromine, iodine, and statin, I'll show you the periodic table right here. These guys, whoa, these guys are group seven, right? As you go down a group, 
Um, it gets bigger and bigger and heavy and heavier. This one is gas, this one is gas, this one's liquid, uh, this one's liquid here, and this one will be solid, okay? Because it's just, it's like a trend, like it changes going down a group. Um, so F2 is gas, here Cl2 is um, gas, that's the most stable form, and then bromine is liquid, that's the most stable form. And then you have hydrogen gas as the most stable form. So all the gases that you know of in the, in the atmosphere are, are always going to be the most stable form. Okay, like oxygen gas, O2, nitrogen gas, O2. It has to be an element. Remember, it can't be a combination. So it has to be pure element. So N2 is zero gas, H2 is zero for the gas. And then anything that's not a pure element, you see there's numbers to it. Some are positive, some are negative. That means some of them are endothermic to form, some is exothermic to form. But the ones that are zero are the most uh, stable form of that pure element. Zero for oxygen. Uh, see how solid the metal itself is going to be? Uh, zero, sodium metal is zero. And then um, sulfur is um, S8 to zero. Uh, you don't need to worry about this too much. Okay, so now that we have that, there's something called writing the equations of formation. So I'm going to go ahead and show you that. So the rules to write a standard formation uh, equation is you have to um, decide what you're writing for and you have to use the most stable element for each of the items and the element in there. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and show you um, examples. It's easy for me to go ahead and do examples of it. Okay. So, equation. Oh my guys, are not. Of formation. So we have to use the delta H F, delta H not F zero elements as reactants. So who are these zero guys? The most stable form of the element, okay? Most stable form of the element at standard conditions. Okay, that, use them as the reactant, and we have to make exactly one mole of desired compound. Okay, so we want to write equation of formation for CO2 gas. And then on the table, if you look at CO2 gas, it will be delta HF equals to negative 393.5 kilojoules per mole. Okay, and that will be on the table right there. But they're like writing information for this guy. How would you write information for this guy? Well, I would pick carbon and graphite because I showed you earlier graphite was zero and diamond wasn't. And I would pick oxygen gas because that was a zero value. And I will try to make it go to one mole of carbon dioxide. What do you know if it's perfectly? And that is the equation of formation. This delta H of this reaction is the same as the formation value here, which is negative 393.5 kilojoules. Isn't that cool? Like when you write an equation of formation, it matches exactly the delta H formation on the table. Okay, so let's write another equation of formation now. Right, equation of formation for MgCO3 solid. Well, delta HF from the table will be negative 1095.8 kilojoules per mole. So for Mg uh, magnesium, the most stable form is solid, and then graphite for carbon, and then um, oxygen gas for our oxygen source, and then you go to MgCO3 solid. And then you gotta say, well, that's one, that's one, but that is the wrong amount. I got two, I got three. So how do you fix it? You put three or two. Um, for equation formation, they don't care about the fractions. You just leave the fraction there. They want you to force it to make one mole. So then your delta H of the reaction um, 
this standard condition equals to the same number, negative 1095.8 kilojoules. That's how you do it. Isn't that cool? You want to do another one? Let's do another one for formation, equation of formation of C6H12O6. Okay, this one here is uh, uh, the glucose, so delta H formation is negative 1273.3 kilojoules per mole. And then if you wrote the equation, it will be 6 graphite. And then plus 6H2 gas plus 3O2 gas because we want to make C6H12O6 um, solid. And the delta H reaction is the same number, negative 1273.3. The reason why I put six here because I want six carbon, six H2 to get 12 hydrogen, three O2 to get six oxygen. Okay, so that's how you do that. Now, because we have these table of values for formation of everybody, um, if you ever have, um, have to calculate the delta H from the table, you can do it. Because let me show you that. So basically, if you want to calculate the delta H standard of the reaction, you can take the total of all the products minus all the reactants because it's a standard state. The product is final, reactant is initial. So all the final minus all the initial will give you the delta H of the reaction since delta H is a state function, okay? So I want to show you this uh, question here. Um, for NH3, gas plus 5O2 gas goes to 4NO gas plus 6H2O gas. Delta H of the reaction is, we don't know what it is. So, and then you look on the table, they'll give you a table of values, delta HF in kilojoules per mole, so they'll give this to you on a test. They say for ammonia, the value is negative 45.9, for NO, the value is positive 91.3. For H2O gas, the value is negative 241.8. So this is a 91. Okay, so to do this kind of problem, they ask you that by giving you a table. Super easy, take all the products minus all the reactants. So delta H of the reaction equals all the products minus all the reactants. So each, this is per mole. So how many moles of this? I have four moles of NO. So four moles times positive 91.3 kilojoules per mole. And then plus six of water, six times negative 241.8 kilojoules per mole. So this is all my products minus all my reactant, which is four, moles times ammonia is negative 45.9 kilojoules per mole. And then you got a plus oxygen, you're like, wait, didn't give me oxygen's value. Oh, why didn't you give me oxygen's value? Because oxygen is the most stable form. So what value is that? You have to know that one's zero. Five moles times zero. Okay, so you always need to remember which one's zero and they won't give it to you. Sometimes they will, but a lot of times they won't. So you get your total answer, put all this together in your calculator. But always remember this is product minus reactant. People mess this part up and then get, or sometimes they put it wrong in a calculator. Make sure you know how to do this, okay? And you should get negative 902.0 kilojoules. There's a lot of practice problems um, on our homework and everything. So I want you guys to be practicing that. So, um, and that is the end of chapter seven. Woohoo, you made it, guys. We made it. Um, so, here's the important formulas um, on slide number 55. Go over it. These are stuff that I pretty much want you to memorize. This one's bomb calorimeter. 
This one's for a coffee cup calorie meter. And remember, if coffee cup calorie meter isn't um, um, completely insulated, you have to add QCal uh, um, on top of the regular solution and the reaction opposite signs. So just go back and through the notes and look at it, okay? Um, as a bonus, I wanted to show you a problem that takes a little bit of critical thinking that's combining multiple parts. So I kind of like this problem. So we'll do a bonus problem here, okay? So this is the end, I promise. Given one S, one, line one SO2 goes to S solid plus O2 gas, delta H is positive 300 kilojoules, okay? And then two is two SO2 goes, oh, not goes two is plus. I'm sorry. Goes to 2SO3 gas. Delta H of this is negative 200 kilojoules. And it says use this information to calculate heat of formation of SO3 gas. Assume S solid is the most, you know, that's actually not technically true. This question tells you to assume it, okay? Most stable, it's not true because I just showed you the table, but that wasn't it. Most stable form of sulfur, O2 gas, is the most stable form of oxygen. We know that one's true. Okay, so how do we do this? It's kind of like a Hess's law plus a heat of formation equation. So how do you write heat of formation equation? S plus O2 goes to SO3. Okay, that's our equation. And then since I need three, I put three O2 right there. And we have to look for the delta H of this guy. Okay, so how do well you get this from these two lines? Well, we do Hess's law now. So you key the formation equation, Hess's law, combined together in one problem. So when you just look at how creative they get. Okay, so line one, what do you want to do line one? I think I want to use S, so S I'm going to go ahead and flip. So flip line one. So I get S solid, that's the correct sign now, plus O2 goes to SO2. So because I flipped my delta H is negative 300 kilojoules. And then let's look at line two. What do I want to do line two? Line two, SO2, I can use SO2. No SO2 repeats, I don't want to do that. O2 repeats, I don't want to do that. So SO3 is what I'll use, okay? We use S and we use SO3. So SO3, I needed to form one mole on the product side. So I just have to half it. So I'm gonna half it because it's already on the correct side. So half it means SO2 plus half of O2 goes to SO3. Delta H is going to be half of negative 200. And then we add it up. That's one and a half, see? So, and then SO2 cancels off. So S plus 3O2O2 goes to SO3, perfect. So the answer here is gonna be negative 400 kilojoules. And that is how we do this problem. The end of chapter seven.